Welcome back to the R series, uh, a tidyverse approach. This is Ryan Womack, data librarian at New Brunswick Libraries at Rutgers University. And this session is going to be on data wrangling with R. Uh, so we will be using our familiar uh, approach of the code from the GitHub site. Uh, links will be down below in the description. I'll refer uh, briefly to um, the master libguide, and I will refer primarily to the Tidyverse site at a, at a couple of different points in the session. And I'm running my own RStudio that's been customized a bit with the interface. Uh, you can also run your own version of R on any device you'd like, or if you'd like a quick setup, you can try rstudio.cloud. Uh, so we're going to be using rdatawrangling.r as the file for today. And really the focus here is on manipulating your data. Uh, there's, a, there's a fair amount to cover, so I'm just going to jump right in and I'm going to move quickly through. Uh, given that this is the video, I encourage you to pause, stop, rewind, um, slow down whenever you uh, hit something you want to take a moment to understand, or conversely, double that speed if you'd like to zoom through uh, things that you're already familiar with. So I'm not going to install the Tidyverse because I've already, I'm already ready for that here on my system. Uh, I will load the tidyverse with the command library tidyverse on line 10. And um, we're, we're really going to stay very much within the tidyverse today. This is the most uh, tidyverse centric of, I guess, the, the different parts of this series. And when we load the tidyverse, we, we know that it brings in these default packages into the R workspace. Um, the core tidyverse are eight packages, one of which we've already seen, ggplot2, in the previous session. But the rest are all data manipulation packages. Uh, read R, per R, forecat, stringer, dplyr, tibble, and tidyr, which we will, some of which we'll talk about more than others, some of which we'll touch on briefly. But after this session, I hope you have a familiarity with all of this side of the tidyverse. Okay, so we're going to start with just basics, like how do we import data into R? Typically, you know, you're not going to be typing or editing data in the R space. You're going to need to bring it in from an external file. And the starting point for that in tidyverse land is the read R package. Um, so I'm just grabbing some files that I have loaded on my website. These are very tiny little sample files. I use the download file command in line 22. And I am using read R, which has already been imported when I when I did that library tidyverse command. I activated read R. Uh, so if you just wanted to, to get read R by itself, right, you could always just do library read read R. But when we loaded the tidyverse as a group, we've already taken care of this. Um, so we start with just a basic tab separated file. Um, if we want to take a look at what this looks like on the website, um, I'll do that briefly. We'll go over here. And this is just a very tiny little sample data set with four observations of three variables. Uh, separated obviously by tabs. So there's a function read underscore TSV which reads a tab separated value file into R. And we're going to use our familiar assignment operator to assign what's read in to something we, we're calling my data. So on the left side that's totally arbitrary. That's the variable name, sorry, the object name that we choose. And on the right is what happens to it. Now you'll notice if you're familiar with the way base R does these things that when we read in something in the tidyverse 
we get extra information. So you'll see this, and I'm actually going to um, move my screen around a bit. So we have a little bit more uh, focus on the console down here. And it summarizes what happened. It brought in these this data. It assigned certain things um, as a double, which is a, a formatted um, integer without um, decimal points. Uh, we have a character value. Uh, and so it's, it's giving us that information. And it also tells us that when we looked at the, um, the data here, right, there was no column name for the first um, column. And what Radar did for us was fill in that column name with an arbitrary variable name of x1. Now you may see, if you're familiar with the base R's, base R's behavior, a little bit of difference there in how base R would uh, import this, this data. Later, we're going to see read underscore TSV, CSV, excuse me, CSV for comma separated value in action. Um, you know, read R is a very straightforward kind of package. Um, we're going to talk in a bit about the difference between the tibble, which is how uh, tidyverse formats its data when it comes in, and a base R data frame. Uh, but for now, let's, you know, we're sticking with the basics and as I mentioned, I'm going to go back and forth to the Tidyverse site. The, the great thing about Tidyverse is that all that documentation is on the site. It's all in very consistent formats. And so we can just go to readr.tidyverse.org to get our description of what's going on there. The reference tab will give us a summary of all the different commands that are available. And so you can see the readr uh, brings in common text formatted files, including things like log files. Um, it has other features to work with, you know, slightly um, more complex forms of data um, or to parse specific columns, specific elements. Um, so it, it is, even though it's very simple to use for basic standard purposes, it is powerful as well. And I'm not going to illustrate this very much, but I do want to um, mention that everything that we can read into R, we can write out as well. So if we read a CSV file in, we can make some changes and we can write it out um, and get output uh, directly from the command line. So, you know, this session is designed just to give you a quick introduction, so I'm not going to go further than that. But um, other thing I will mention about the Tidyverse um, help is that there's always going to be this cheat sheet. I don't want to say always. I haven't looked at all the, the Tidyverse packages, but for the major Tidyverse packages, you will find a cheat sheet that summarizes the primary commands. And so that's very good once you've got a little bit of familiarity with the package. Um, you need a reminder of just, okay, here's a command I can use. The cheat sheets are there uh, with all that already neatly summarized for you. Okay, let's jump back into our studio. Now, if you want to read Excel files, and I'm going to editorialize, as I often do, um, you know, Excel files are uh, extremely commonly used. You're going to end up dealing with them. But for me, if I have an Excel file, I really prefer to just convert it to a CSV file straight away. Um, that lets me know that I'm dealing directly with pure data, you know, nothing that has a formula in a cell hidden somewhere. Um, kind of gets rid of some of those unnecessary formatting things that, that go on in an Excel file, uh, n things that don't help you when you're actually trying to analyze data. Um, so I would encourage you to stay away from Excel files or convert them to CSV files. But if you do need to read them, there is a package for that. That is read Excel. And 
you can install it, you can load the library. This is not part of the, the core tidyverse, so you do have to load it separately as read Excel, as I did in line 35. Um, here we're going to download an Excel file, um, which I also have mounted for you to grab. Um, the command on line 38 is just read underscore Excel and the name of the file. And one other thing which you'll notice, which is a comma one. Um, so as you probably know, spreadsheets, Excel files can have multiple sheets within one file, right? You've got those little tabs across the bottom and each of those can contain separate sets of data. So you do need to specify which um, sheet you're going to be pulling data from. Now, by default, it's going to look at the first sheet. Uh, technically, you don't have to write comma one, uh, but I'm including that here so you are aware that's what it's doing. It's looking at the first sheet. If you need to refer to a, another sheet in the, in, the, in the file, you have to specify it either by number or you can use the name of the sheet if you've got named uh, sheets within one Excel file. And once we've seen this being read in, of course, once it's in R, it is um, formatted as an R data object. And so let me talk a little bit about what's being displayed here is we have not only the data itself and not only the variable names, but a little bit of extra information that's in gray that's part of what Tidyverse does to things. This is the Tibble data format, and it shows you the size of the matrix, that it is in fact a Tibble, and the um, type of variable each of those variables is. Is it a character variable? Is it a, a integer? Um, is it a, a decimal value? or a logical value, right? Those all, all will be things that show up uh, in this summary view. Um, but, you know, you need to import Excel. The read Excel command does that for both the old style XLS files and the newer XLSX files. And there's this, another package called write Excel that you might want to use if you need to write out an Excel file. That's not built into read Excel. Uh, it's just a separate package. Um, now in the in the code, I have referred in the comments to several other um, packages that are are mostly part of the tidyverse uh, that you may want to use if you have statistical software that's generated your data like SPSS or SAS or Stata. Haven will do the work for you. Um, Google Drive is quite useful if you are working with files on a Google Drive. You can interact directly with those files. You can pull them in from within R. You can write to them and make changes from within R. And others that are in the same sort of spirit, they're not technically part of the Tidyverse because they, they haven't been developed under the umbrella of RStudio and the Tidyverse, uh, but they're useful data packages. JSON Lite for JSON format files. XML2 for XML, HTTR, which uh, lets you grab things via web APIs. And if you simply want to scrape data off a website, that's RVEST. And we have also DBI for relational databases. So DBI is kind of like the fundamental building block. If you're going to deal with any databases, you need DBI. That's database interchange, uh, I believe it stands for. And often you will need a specific secondary program to connect to, you know, a particular type of database. Like if you've got a PostgreSQL database, you would use the package R Postgres to link to that. And that allows you to run SQL commands from within R, connect to the database, pull things out based on those SQL commands. All that is possible. And you can take a look at db.rstudio.com if you want more information about working with databases.
you know, in general, um, you know, all the connections that you can imagine are there. Um, there's a, also a tool I maybe should mention that I'm going to go ahead and add that in the comments here um, is our clone. Uh, and that's for working with with cloud sites like Amazon Web Services. Um, so you'll see our clone um, mentioned when we have our Amarel based workshops coming up. So as you can see from the, the DB site, db.rstudio.com will uh, give you a guide to how to really work with databases if that's what you need to do. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about the Tibble in slightly more detail. We've seen it in the basic form. Um, the Tibble is explained at tibble.tidyverse.org. Let me go to this one. And you know, I find the language that Tidyverse site uses is quite useful in understanding what they're all about, right? So R, base R uses the data frame, data dot frame everywhere to organize data. Uh, it is like a, a very straightforward um, matrix of data on a, on a spreadsheet. Um, the only difference between a, a, a pure matrix, which has to have everything of one type, either you know characters or numbers, a data frame can mix and match. Uh, some columns can be numeric, some columns can be characters, etc. Um, but when R imports things into a data frame, it makes certain assumptions. Like it will attempt to convert data for you. Um, for example, you have a column that's, you know, 90 numbers and one, um, one letter. It might convert that variable into a categorical variable because it sees the letter and says it has to um, be a string. And we're going to, by default, convert those strings into factors um, to represent different levels. And that can be useful, but it can sometimes be confusing. Um, and other things that our data frame does by default, making its best guess at the data, can throw you off. They might not be exactly what you'd expect. But tibbles are different in that they are lazy and surly, in the words of the site. Um, they won't change types. Uh, on their own. Um, they will instead complain and throw off an error if things are, are mismatching. So this is typically a problem at the sort of data import stage. You're trying to read something into R. Uh, the Tibble might throw off some errors until you have cleaned up your data to the point that, you know, everything in one column is well behaved, it's well understood. Um, and as it says, this forces you to confront problems earlier, leaning, leading towards cleaner and more expressive code. Now that is, um, again, a, part of the tidyverse approach. They believe it's beneficial. Uh, sometimes if you really just want to do quick and dirty exploratory analysis, um, you may not need that um, extra fussiness that the Tibble brings. And so... Just keep that in mind that it's not always the best way to do things. Uh, so let's let's load the library Tibble just separately to make sure. And I've talked a lot about it, but in practice, you know, it's actually not a big deal at all. The difference between a Tibble and the original data frame in in uh, R because you can always very simply. With, as in line 81, 
run the as data frame as dot data dot frame command to convert a tibble into a regular R data frame. And so now you see an R data frame without specifying a tibble, without the little extra explanatory bits. And, you know, because underneath, right, the data is the same, right? The, the actual da data in the cells is the same. Um, so you can convert it. You may often need to convert it because lots of packages, um, although the tidyverse is great and it's expanding, it is not all of R and there's many, many, many important uh, useful contributions that are not even gonna, those packages are not even gonna recognize what a tibble is. So you, you're gonna have to convert things back to a data frame uh, in order to work with a lot of packages in R. And you can do that, you know, on a temporary basis like this with as data frame. Um, also, if you have a data frame, you can convert it to a tibble. And that is with this command on line 82, um, as underscore tibble. Now here I'm just using the iris data. Iris is a built-in data set um, with measurements of flowers. Uh, if I look at, if I just type iris, uh, what it's going to do is print out the data frame version. And what that will do is just attempt to print the whole data set. And here it actually succeeds. Uh, there's typically a default limit, like it, it'll cut off after 10,000 rows, um, which can be messy. Now, sometimes you might like this, uh, some, but sometimes this is messy. So we, we'll notice when we look at the Tibble version, what it does is simply show us the first 10 rows of data and it will also show us highlights of the variables as well if there are too many variables to display. So that is, it's again built as a feature of, of the Tibble format that it doesn't clog up your screen, uh, but you can choose which way you like things better. Um, I want you also to be aware of data.table um, because uh, and this is, you know, I'm just reporting on what what people say. I haven't really used data table myself extensively, but data dot table. Th there are times when you're going to run into limitations of the base R data frame and or the tibble when you have big data. You've got a you've got a lot of data. Manipulating those matrices starts to take up a lot of memory and processing time. Data dot table has been designed to work better in those situations. And it has its own special command to import data, which is called fread. Um, otherwise, you know, they're not huge differences. Um, the differences are more under the skin in the performance. So if you ever have performance issues, you might want to look into data table and look at the link here on line 87. Okay, so we have we have talked about the tibbles. We've talked about read R. Let's talk about tidy R. Okay, so tidy R is in a sense this is one of really the core concepts of the tidyverse. Why it's called the tidyverse um, is driving you towards good data practices. And tidy R is a package to help you create what's called tidy data. What is tidy data? Tidy data has these three characteristics. Every column is a variable. I've got a typo there. Every row is an observation. And every cell is a single value, right? So this is, picture your spreadsheet. Um, it's a well-behaved Excel spreadsheet where the top first row of our data set has the variable names in it and no other notes, no other other stuff. Um, each row is a is one observation and every single cell is filled in with just one value. Um, or it could be, a, you know, an NA for a missing value, but nothing else, nothing more uh, exotic or strange. And so we would like to get our data in a tidy format 
because that is going to eliminate any errors. It's, you know, you want to compute the mean of something and you've got one cell there that's trying to report two different values. Um, it's, that's a problem, right? Uh, so the tidy R helps us achieve this basic simplicity that makes our, our data work accurate. So if we look at tidy R, um, the reference here, you know, there, there are um, only a few sort of core uh, things that are done with the data uh, in tidy R. And we're, we're not going to look at too many of them. Uh, we are going to look at pivoting um, data and we can do other, we're, we're, we're going to look at nesting data. And tidy R is all about uh, just sort of those very basic, you know, pushing our data around uh, in the matrix, rearranging it, um, grouping it, ungrouping it, things like that. Um, so you, you can consult the reference for more information. You can consult the cheat sheet. Um, as well, um, the cheat sheet I will mention does not really emphasize the pivot function, but the pivot function is important because it is the new way that um, tidy tidy R is dealing with um, wide and long formats of data, and so I'm going to talk about what that is in just a second. Um, Actually, before we actually load the, the bigger example, I'm going to talk about it in a, a small uh, form just by showing you a, a spreadsheet, right? So what I mean by wide and long, this is a very common concept in working with data is, and this is similar to the data, the data set we're about to bring in. Um, if I have data that looks like this country variable and then I have a few entries of the variable for different years right so I might have US China India and we'll start with just one variable like GDP um, and then some numbers right over here. There might be some slow GDP growth. Um, so this data is called wide because the data entries push out to the right uh, and the data is actually filled in in a wide format. There's another format which is the long format um, and in that case It looks more like this. Um, this would be a little easier to understand like this. And I've got a column now that says year. And this would be our year entries. And now my data would be filled in. Let's see if I can get the same, the correct numbers there. The numbers in this, this is a meaningless example, but just to have some numbers. So we would have something that looks like this. Now here, there's only one column in the um, in the data frame that ultimately represents the the data that we care about, right? The observational data. Everything else is descriptive. And as we add more data, more countries, more years, uh, it all goes down in down vertically. And so that is long data. Now, the thing is, there are some procedures that work better with long data and other procedures that you, you want to put the data in a wide format. Often the data in a wide format is easier also to parse and understand. So 
it's a common thing to want to switch these things back and forth. But if you're in a spreadsheet, you know, you want to, it's, it's tricky to cut and paste and transpose the right parts of the matrix. I did it with this tiny example, but as this gets large, obviously that would be a bit hairy um, because we want to transpose part of the data, but not all of it, right? We want to keep the country and variable. You know, it's not just a straight matrix transposition. The great thing about R is that R can do this for you. So we're going to load some data and then we're going to pivot it in just a second. So in line 102, and this is the same uh, example data that we used in the first session, but we're going to go further with it this time. Um, I'm, I'm going out to the World Bank site. I am grabbing uh, the gender statistics data, and it is a real data set, not enormous, but a little bit big, so it's going to take a moment to download it. Um, we are going to then unzip it on line 103, because what we did in the first line was bring it into our local file structure. It's still not our data, it's just a zip file sitting on our computer. We have to unzip it, and then in line 104, we read the data in with the read underscore CSV function. Um, so you might have noticed, you probably have noticed, but I didn't say it explicitly, that the tidyverse functions prefer this style of underscore and there is also a read dot CSV uh, function, which is the base R version of reading data, right? So if you see a data uh, command with a dot, that's likely to be base R. A command with an underscore likely to come from tidyverse. That's the style. Um, and I'm also, I guess, influenced by that. So I'm naming the uh, object that we're creating uh, gender underscore data when I read it in. And you'll notice that this is now uh, has now appeared in our environment as gender underscore data. And it's not too small, 164,000 observations of 66 variables. Let's look at how tidyverse displays that. So we have gender data and Obviously, we wouldn't want to print out 164,000 observations. Here we just get 10, uh, and the 10 are just, these are countries, but they're also these also some groupings of areas of the world. So we have Arab world. We have a few of these indicators. Um, there are some questionnaires about whether women can um, get a driver's license, whether they can register to vote, whether they can do different um, things in the society. Um, it's a little hard to tell from the abbreviation, um, but we have country name, country code, indicator name, indicator code. And after that, we have years. So this data goes back to 1960, and it goes all the way up to 2020. But all the variable names that don't fit on the screen just get listed down here. That Hey, there's 59 more variables in the data set. And there's one other sort of rogue column there that's x66 that has that's crept in. We're going to not really worry about that. We'll see how to manipulate these things in a second. Um, now, line 105 is, this is a little bit of a trick. This is using our matrix notation that we, we mentioned in previous sessions. Um, what I'm doing is taking all the rows of gender data, which I indicate by just a blank, not even a blank space, but just nothing, right? So I say bracket, nothing, comma, and then the columns that I'm interested in are all of the columns except for columns two and four, minus two, minus four. Uh, and the C there doesn't stand for column, right? The C is R's uh, combine or concatenate function. So this is just a way to create a list of uh, I could equally well say my list is minus 2, minus 4, C minus 2, minus 4. Um, and then when I look at what is my list, it's just those two numbers together. 
Uh, hopefully that makes that a little clearer. Um, the reason I'm doing that on line 105 is I'm just not interested in these codes. Country name is enough for me. Indicator name is enough for me, just to simplify my life. So I'm going to run 105. Be careful just to run that once, because if you run it again, you're going to knock out two more columns that are going to be useful data for you. All right, now we come to our pivot command on line 107. Uh, this data is wide, right? We can see that from the summary that the years stretch out on and on to the right in wide format. So we are going to make it long. We use the command pivot longer. And I will walk through this syntax a little more closely. Um, we have our original data set, gender underscore data. And I need to tell our which columns are we're going to be switching. Uh, now, after I removed those two columns, again, just to give you a clear view of this, what I did to gender data, I now only have the two columns that are more descriptive, country name and indicator name. So those I'm going to leave alone, but I want to grab all the other columns in the data set. And those run um, up through, it's actually a 64 element matrix, uh, 64 columns. Um, so I'm going to get rid of x66 in this step right away um, by not including it. Um, now, the, the code here, I haven't edited it yet because it needs a little bit of help. Uh, it was last year's version, so I'm missing some columns. Um, so I'm going to go up through column 63, but not include column 64, which is this sort of garbage variable x66. So that should take all of our years up through 2020. Uh, then I'm going to take the names of the columns, and I'm going to turn them into something called year. Now, if you take a look, obviously this works better for data that's in a certain kind of format. Obviously, time series format is, is one of the things it's designed for. So I can, since these are all similar to each other, I can call all those column names year and have the result be meaningful. Um, if these weren't quite, you know, as homogenous, um, what to do with those is less obvious, but I think you, you get the idea. And then I'm going to take the values, right? So the values are what's in the cells. And unfortunately, the early years of the Arab world, there, there aren't actually answers to these uh, questions. Um, but values will be put into a new column called value. And I do this uh, typically, uh, and I would highly recommend you do this for all your major data steps. Uh, don't overwrite your original data. Uh, do it in multiple stages so that if you do make a mistake or you do need to refer to the original data as it was read in, uh, you, can, you can go directly back to that. So here I'm just calling my second stage gender data two. And now I'm finally running line 109. Um, if you if you run this one on um, R Studio, it's a little bit big uh, for the number of the memory space that's allocated on R Studio Cloud. Um, if you're running on the cloud, I should have said. Uh, so you might need to um, slice the data down a bit into something a bit uh, smaller. You can do that by instead of taking so I'm going to just include this in the code if you need to reduce the size of the data for example for our studio cloud try this and that would be something like gender data is 
gender data. And you could simply take, uh, you know, a sort of selection of the rows. I could say rows one through 10,000, comma, something like that. Now I'm not gonna run that because I, I can work with all the data on this machine that I'm using right now. Okay, so that was sort of an aside. Uh, I know that's an issue on some of the RStudio um, installations. So what does gender data two look like? Gender data two is long and look at that. I've still got that X66 in there. I thought that I would have gotten rid of it with my column specification, but I guess not. Oh, I see what, I know what happened. So when I took out the two columns, I didn't check again. Um, the original gender data is, yes. So I'm not accounting for the, well, I, I, I have to say, I don't quite understand that because um, we have 64 columns here. And if I had only looked at, well, I could do that more explicitly um, with a statement like this. I, I do want to clean this up for you and make it as clear as possible. So uh, to get rid of column, the nasty column that has the, the x66 variable, um, I am going to do this. I want all of the rows and columns 1 through 63. Let's see if that works. Okay, and so now our last column, the X66, has been dropped off. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. Um, why I couldn't do that in line 114, but let me not worry about those details and just do what I need to to fix it up. The, the, the code that you'll see on the site after I upload the video is going to be this modified code. So you're seeing me making the edits in real time. All right, so now our gender data two just has four columns, country name, indicator name, year, and then all of the values uh, all in one column called value. So in order to figure out what those values refer to, we do have to kind of refer back to the indicator name and year. Um, it's just the way that long data works. Uh, I think I'm going to pause the video here just for convenience of making the chunks a little uh, smaller on YouTube and come back in a second to pick up with the pipe.